more and more people are deciding church isn't for them. They just don't see the point. It's not hard to see why. It's a sin not to be this light has come to earth. You're walking right through the gates of hell. Ever found yourself thinking we'd all be better off without religion? Here's the crazy part. Jesus agrees with you. Losing my religion. So, um, <clears throat> Angelina Jolie and I <laughs> are a lot alike. Uh, when I took a public speaking course at Sacramento State University in Sacramento, uh, the professor talked about how you should always have an opening line that hooks and grabs people's attention. And I just thought those four words, Angelina Jolie and I, like, I mean, that you're hooked, right? Like, how could that be any more attention grabbing? And then you add in the fact that her and I are so much alike. Um, clearly, you're bought in. You want to know, what is this about? Uh, for starters, we are both the same age. And um, she doesn't look it, and I look it. <laughs> Um, also I watch movies and she makes them, uh, we're both international sex symbols. I know it's hard to imagine. I mean, she's probably never been mistaken for the grandparent of her own kids at a local gas station like I have, but still, um, but, but we're alike in some ways that are actually a little bit more important. So a few months ago, uh, I was reading an article and ran across a quote from her from an old, ma uh, an old magazine interview that she had done. And she was talking about insecurity. And this is what she said. She said, at times, I've struggled being happy with myself. I've always hid in and around other people. I, or I tried to find myself through characters pretending to live out in those lives things that I didn't have in my own. And when I read that, I thought, wow, that's pretty self-aware for somebody in Hollywood to, to actually admit that. Um, she also said this, she said, the great thing about being pregnant is that you don't need an excuse to pee or eat, which I just thought I've never, never needed an excuse to eat. So I was like, that's another thing we have in common, Angelina Jolie. But, but, but seriously, her honesty about her insecurity and pretending really actually struck me. In fact, that's kind of the other big thing that her and I have in common, acting. Now, I've never been paid for my acting abilities, but I'm actually better at it than you might think because I've had times like Angelina where I struggled to be who I wanted to be or, or where I just couldn't seem to live like I wanted to live. And so I faked it. And it's embarrassing to admit, but I've regularly in my life, pretended to be better than I am. And I, I don't want to, I, I wanna keep it real, but I often find myself like not measuring up to what I think that you think that I should be. And, and even worse, I don't measure up to what I think I should be. And maybe worst of all, I don't measure up to what I think God thinks that I should be. And so it's completely painful and embarrassing to admit, but there have been times where I've acted better than I am, where I pretended to be who I thought I should be or what I, who I thought God wanted me to be instead of being honest about who I am. There have been times where I've tried to come off more knowledgeable or likable, funny and spiritual, more courageous and loving and friendly and talented and just more all around awesome than I actually am or probably ever could be. Because the truth is I wanna be a really great husband. I, I wanna be a great dad. I, I wanna be a, a good friend. I, I want to be a, a, a great follower of Jesus. I want my life to reflect that. I, I wanna be a great pastor and leader. And if I can't, or if I fail at that, well, I still want you to think that I am. And so I'll just let you see the parts that most make me look that way. And I do it without even thinking about it. And I would bet if we were having a conversation and you were up here that you would admit that you do that too. I, in fact, I'd put money that you're an actor as well. And here's the, here's the irony of that. Like I hate when people are fake, don't you? Right, we, we all do. And yet 
I kind of just admitted that I don't always let you see the real me. And isn't that one of the dilemmas for us as human beings, that, that we all hate when people are fake, but we all have moments where we're faking it. We all, we all do. And so what do we call someone who says one thing and does another? That's right, a politician. <laughs> right? No, of course, we call them hypocrites. And everybody hates hypocrites. I mean, nobody is out there standing up for picketing on behalf of hypocrites. Nobody's like up with hypocrites, be more phony. Like that, there's not a constituency for people for hypocrisy, right? And we dislike hypocrisy in any time that we see it, but there's something like especially repulsive and toxic and problematic when we see and experience it at church from religious people. In fact, it's, it's one of the, the most common critiques that's made against churches and Christians, right? Is that we're all just a bunch of hypocrites. Maybe you've even said that yourself because you have kind of this love-hate thing with, not with God, but with church. And the problem you have with God is that his people are kind of funky. And so you're just like, I, I, I don't know. I, I want to be a part of that thing. I want to be a part of what he's doing. But there's just so many hypocrites there. But is that a fair accus accusation? Is it true? Are we guilty? Maybe a better question is, does it, does it even matter? So one of my favorite writers, his name's Brennan Manning. Um, he, he said these words. He said, the, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then walk out the door and deny him by their life. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Maybe you can relate to that because you know exactly what he's talking about, right? Like you've been around enough or you've known some Christians who are just like that. What's interesting is that the single biggest critic of religious hypocrisy was and is Jesus. In fact, Jesus is the reason that any of us think of the idea of hypocrisy in the way that we do today. So a, a little bit of context or language lesson for you. So the word hypocrite comes from a Greek word that literally just means a performer acting under a mask. That's, that's all it meant. And so in, in Jesus' day when it was being used, it was a very common word. That's all it meant. It was a very benign word and it wasn't really used in spiritual conversations Hardly at all. But then Jesus comes along and he did something that's never been done before. Jesus used that word in a moral and spiritual way to call out phoniness in religion and in religious people. And so in, in a very real sense, the word hypocrite, like the way that we use it, it's almost Jesus's word. In fact, when you read the New Testament, the word hypocrite appears 17 times in the New Testament and all 17 times it was used by Jesus. And honestly, there's only a couple of those that were actually repeats of the same event or the same thing that he was saying because it appears in a couple of different books. And so 15 different distinct times, Jesus calls out hypocrisy. Obviously, it was a really, really big deal to him. But then the question is like, so what are we talking about? Because we don't always mean the same thing when we talk about or we call somebody a hypocrite. Well, for, for starters, Hypocrisy is not when we mess up or when we make a mistake. Because the truth is, we've all said stuff that we wish we didn't say. We've all done stuff that we wish we hadn't done. That's not hypocrisy, that's humanity. And so then what is it? What is a hypocrisy? What is a hypocrite? And the, most of us feel like we kind of know it when we see it, or at least we think we do. But, but more importantly, if Jesus is the one that kind of gave us this idea what did he mean by it? What was he talking about? So in Matthew chapter six is the very first time that Jesus uses the word hypocrite. He kind of talked around it in Matthew five, but he didn't use the word. But in Matthew six, he uses it for the very first time. Matthew chapter six, verses one and two, Jesus says these words. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Could we just stop for a minute? Because that is literally the opposite of what everything in our culture is about, right? If we're gonna do something good, if we're gonna stand for a cause, if we're gonna be good, if we're gonna be righteous, 
we better get it on film. We better get it on camera. We better post about it. We better talk about it so everybody else can see how good and righteous and awesome we are, that we are on the right side of the issues. Jesus says, be careful to practice your righteousness, not in front of other people to be seen by them. He says, if you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. They're like, literally, it means nothing to God. Verse two, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others as the hypocrites do to be honored by others. So whatever else Jesus is saying here, and he's saying a lot, we could spend a few minutes here, but it's clear that what he's saying is that doing good is good, but doing good to be seen is not good. In fact, it's the opposite of good, according to Jesus. It's offensive to God because you're pretending to be something you're not. And so in this particular instance, he's going, you're not compassionate. You're just acting like you're compassionate because you want people to think that you're compassionate. Whoo. I mean, that is some tough talk. I, I love the way that the message translation reads in Matthew 6, verse 1, the verse, first, first verse we just read. This is the way it reads in the message. It says, be especially careful, be especially careful when you're trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you will not be applauding. Whew. Right? Like, Ugh. So uh, uh, a little bit later in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 23, verse five, Jesus is talking about a group of religious leaders, a group of religious people, devout religious people. And he says this, he says, everything they do is done for people to see. Everything they do is done for people to see. And I think if we were honest, we'd have to go like, well, we kind of can relate to that right? Like I, I can, I can kind of relate. And, and honestly, like, I think we'd have to admit that we're pulled that direction more than we even are aware. See, hypocrisy isn't just when something is wrong on the outside. It isn't just being selfish, let's say, because we're all selfish, every single one of us. And, and it's not just saying one thing and doing another, because it's not just that I speak out against selfishness while at the same time I'm selfish. It's that instead of dealing with my selfishness, I engineer the way that I look to make you think that I'm not selfish. So now, in addition to my selfishness, I've added deception. That's hypocrisy. See, part of hypocrisy is knowing that your personal character and your public persona, that they don't match. And you've just kind of been okay. You're just like, yeah, that's, I'm all right. Like, I mean, I don't want people to find out that this is the way that I am, but I'd much rather them think that this is who I am. And, and the tension that we feel about the dissonance between our public persona and our personal character, we just resolve that away. And it's okay. Like we, we've given up trying to bring those things together. See, you have three lives, right? You have your public life, you have your personal life, and then you have your secret life. And part of what Jesus is talking about is that there's this journey, this process of bringing those three lives into alignment so that there's the gap between who you are in public and who you are in your personal life and who you are in your secret life is smaller and smaller and smaller. So I learned recently that Planet Fitness regularly gives out pizza as an incentive to get people to come to the gym and work out. And so I signed up. No, I'm just kidding. Um, like I, if you go to like work out, like, and then they give you pizza on the way out, like, doesn't that just seem wrong? It just feels, I mean, you're not supposed to be getting healthy and also getting an extra large with extra cheese at the same place. But it worked so well, they decided we're also on different days going to give bagels out. And I'm like, what? It's almost as if they don't actually care if you're getting healthy. Like they just want your money. It's almost like that. I don't know. 
But here's the thing. I was thinking about it. That only works because it's true on both sides, right? I mean, aren't there people who want to be seen going to the gym and and they want to be thought of as somebody who works out and so they dress the part because they're going to the gym. But in reality, it's just an excuse to eat free pizza. (laughs) And also they get the benefit of people going, you go to the gym. Yes, I go to the gym to eat pizza. (laughs) I'm not going to tell you that. Right, but that it only works because of that hypocrisy. Now, honestly, when it comes to pizza and working out, uh, do whatever you want, who cares? The point is that we're all prone to move in that direction with everything that we do. And when it comes to your heart and your life and your faith, the more that we move that direction, Jesus makes it clear that it's a massive problem. So a few verses later, In Matthew 23, Jesus says this, and he was just describing that group of people. And he says, everything they do is for other people to see. He says this, he says, woe, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you performers who hide behind a mask. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but the inside, they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind religious people, blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. He goes on, he's not done. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. He's like, in case you just missed what I just said, I got another one for you. He says, you are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, in the same way, just like a whitewashed tomb being full of death, in the same way, on the outside, you appear to other people as being righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Wow, Jesus, maybe you could just like stop like, you know, hinting around what you want to say and actually say it. No wonder they killed this guy, man. Sheesh, that is some straight talk. See, Jesus is essentially going, when you look at how he's teaching, and especially when he gets into this conversation, he's going, there are two parts to you. There's an outside part of your life and there's an inside part of your life. And the temptation, the draw, the overwhelming pull of life for all of us is for you to spend all of your time and energy making the outside look really, really good while ignoring all that's going on on the inside of you. The the pull is for you to put all your effort into how other people perceive you rather than for you to have to confront who you really are. I mean, after all, why in the world would anybody whitewash a tomb? Because they're trying to convince people that there's life on the inside. See, Jesus in these words, he's pointing to the problem of the human condition that there's darkness and death and brokenness and wickedness inside all of us. But I, I can't let you see that. I can't let you know that. I can't let you see the truth about me. So I slowly drift towards, I just want other people to see how good I am. And if you're a person of faith, Jesus is pointing out, that those of us who are, that we seem to be particularly susceptible to the drift of trying to signal to each other how good we are. Now, part of the reason why it's so damaging is that it doesn't just affect how you see me when I'm pretending, when I'm acting, when I'm a hypocrite, but it distorts how I see and relate to you. So last week, we read the first couple of verses in Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to read those again, and we're going to continue on with a couple of other things that he says. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. These might sound familiar to you if you were here last week. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. 
Now, the verses that we're about to read, you may have heard them before, but oftentimes when they're read, they're separated from what came before. And so Jesus is just on a roll now. Verse three, he says, why? Why, why, why? Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank or the log in your own eye? How, how can you say to them, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is this plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll be able to see clearly enough to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So a a few years ago, there was a book that came out um, that was called Why Nobody Wants to Be Around Christians Anymore. It's actually a really, really good book. And in the author's research, as you might imagine, one of the things that kept coming up as they were doing the research for their book was this idea, this accusation, this thing of hypocrisy. But as they dug deeper, what they discovered was something that was really, really interesting. They discovered that that accusation was far more nuanced than what they thought. See, in their research, what they discovered is that people weren't really bothered by the inconsistencies between what Christians say and what they do. In fact, in general, they found that people were pretty understanding about how that happens, kind of just chalking it up to human nature because we all do that. We all have a tendency to say something that we really mean and we really believe, but also behave in a way that kind of betrays that thing that we just said. But what, what they really meant when they used the word hypocrite was what they, they said in the book could only be described as a lack of humility. See, that, that they, as they began to ask questions, what they discovered is that people were like, well, y'all just talk more than you actually listen. Like you just want people to listen to you. And like, that's, there's no humility there. There's like, like, this is rude. All you care about is preaching at people. They, they said things like, well, you just give cliche answers for really complex problems. They, that you always, Christians always act like they know it all. This was my favorite. That you have an unwarranted, this is not a great description. You have an unwarranted sense of superiority. See, in short, it was all the plank and speck moments that Jesus just described. It's people putting all of their effort into making the outside look good in their life and then judging other people for how obviously flawed and messed up their outside looks. Acting as if behind the scenes, we're not all the same. We're not all equally a mess. See, the plank in my eye isn't the problem. It's the audacity to pretend that it isn't there when I'm trying to come and say something to you about what's going on in your life. So Jesus actually told a story that illustrates, I think, what all of this looks like as it plays out. And I I want you, as I read the story, I want you to imagine that you're watching, like you're watching it play out like a movie. It's found in Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse nine. Luke says this, he says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his chest, his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So, First of all, part of what I love about this story is this parable. 
is that we don't have to guess why Jesus told it. We don't have to try to figure out what he meant by it. Sometimes you're reading and Jesus tells a parable and you're like, uh, right? And I know like if you've been around church for a while, you just, we all pretend like we know exactly what Jesus is talking about all the time. Like it's just, isn't it obvious to you, the wheat and the tares, you know, it's like what? But Luke actually tells us, Jesus told this parable because there were some religious people who had gotten real full of themselves that they had reached the point where they felt so good about who they were that they looked down on other people. Now, notice what he says, because I don't want you to miss this. They weren't hostile towards other people. They weren't mean to them. They didn't insult them. They didn't sneer at them. Their sin was, they just looked and thought, I mean, I'm I'm better than that guy. That is why Jesus is telling this story. And so he says, there's two men that went up to the temple, up to church to pray. The first one was a Pharisee. Now in our culture, and if you've been around Christianity, we've villainized Pharisees, but that's not how the people who were there, who Jesus is telling the story to, that's not how they would have seen them. For us, it'd be like if Jesus mentions this like trusted Christian leader that you can think of. The guy that he knows the scriptures, he's got a great YouTube channel. You go there for resources and to learn stuff about the Bible and he's insightful and he's helpful. He lives his faith in a way that you actually wanna live your faith. That's the kind of person that Jesus is describing when he says one of them was a Pharisee. The second guy is a tax collector. It's really, really hard for us to wrap our minds around this because it's very difficult for us to have a moral equivalent of what a tax collector represented for them. Because this was a Jew, a tax collector was a Jew who had purchased the right from Rome, the brutal, oppressive occupiers who were completely fine with murdering and raping your own people. They were people who purchased the right from Rome to personally enrich themselves from the taxes that were being collected to pay for that occupying force. They were the wealthy, politically connected who had betrayed and sold out their country and their people so that they could game the system and personally gain benefit and money for their, from their own people's sufferings. That's what a tax collector was. I mean, just a horrible human being. Now, I know when we read the story, it's kind of flipped for us. But if there's a good guy and a bad guy in this story, when Jesus is telling it, the tax collector is a thousand percent the bad guy. That's why Luke has to explain to the people who would read this afterwards, who weren't there, what's going on. Because they would have been confused. Why would Jesus even tell the story? Everybody knows tax collectors are going straight to hell. So the (laughs) fair... Some fans of the IRS in the. uh... (laughs) So the Pharisee prays this. He says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I'm not like robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a 10th of all I get. And I want to stop here because honestly, there's nothing wrong with this guy's prayer. It's not a show like what Jesus was talking about earlier. He's sincere. He's grateful that God has changed him. He's been devout and dedicated to his faith. He follows God's laws and God's standards. He's honest. He doesn't take from or cheat other people. He's been faithful to his wife. And on top of all that, he tithes, he gives, he's generous regularly. He fasts regularly so that he can actually connect with God. But then it says that the tax collector stood at a distance and he wouldn't even look up to heaven. But he beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. To which everybody would have been like, what? That's it? Like no long confession, no penance, no acknowledgement of the pain that you've caused, no promises to change and do better, no commitment to go to church or be a follower of Jesus. Just God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's it? And then comes the showstopper. Then comes something that Jesus says that would have stunned everybody, that there would have been audible gasps in the crowd. Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other one, went home justified before God. And you can just, in the 
film in your mind, you can see the confusion on everybody's face and those like question marks over everybody's head. What are you talking about, Jesus? That guy? See, here's the point. There is a moment coming when you will become aware that you are not what you thought you were. There's a moment coming where you will become aware where you are not what you thought that you were. There's a moment coming where I will become aware that I am not what I thought I am because we all have them. We have those moments where your view of who you are will be painfully confronted by what you actually are. That moment is a moment of incredible grace and severe mercy from God that he lets you see that, that he lets me see that. And when that moment occurs, you and I have two options. We can do what the Pharisee did. We can turn and compare ourselves to someone else. We will have a moment where all of the darkness that's inside of you that you don't even think is there will try to drag your attention away from what you've just encountered and realized to anything and anyone else other than you. Where you will be tempted to go, God, I thank you that I'm not like them because you've saved me. In fact, you know what? Here, hey, come here, come here. Let let me help you with the speck in your eye because I'm so, I'm just so grateful that God has changed me. You will have the choice to turn and compare yourself to the people around you or like the tax collector, you can throw yourself on the mercy of Jesus, overwhelmed that God would even love somebody like you. See, that moment is coming. You've probably already had one, but that moment comes, those moments come for all of us. And when it comes, what will you do? What will you do when it does? See, God does not require us to be perfect, but he does require us to stop pretending with him, with ourselves, with other people. The point of Jesus's story is the second guy's response should have been the response from both guys when they walked up to pray that they were both messed up, broken, and sinful, that they both needed God's grace and God's mercy. One guy knew it, but the other guy didn't. And it was the exact opposite of what it appeared on the surface. See, if you're a Christian, honestly, if you're a follower of Jesus, listen to me. This story from Jesus should terrify you. It does me. I think about this story all the time because the religious guy was blinded to his desperate need for God's mercy and he was blinded by the changes and the moral betterments that he had made in response to his own faith. But those betterments and those changes became the thing that he started to trust in rather than God's grace and God's mercy. Both of the men were justified The religious guy justified himself by comparing himself to to the tax collector because that's what hypocrisy does. It justifies itself. But the other guy, Jesus says, he was justified by, he was made right with God. And then Jesus adds that little dagger at the end. For all of those who exalt themselves will be humbled and all of those who humble themselves will be exalted. And you know what exalt means? It means to elevate yourself, to place yourself. This, the, the Pharisee, the guy who ends up being the, the bad guy in the story, his only sin starting out was that he elevated himself above the other guy. Those who are exalted will be humbled and those who are humble will be exalted. See, Jesus is going, it starts with you. We don't have time to get into this. It's a conversation for another day. But there is a conversation to be had because what Jesus is not saying is, he's not saying that there's never a time where you come alongside somebody else and help them with the issue in their life. He's not saying that. But he's making it loud and clear. It starts with you. 
It starts with you looking yourself in the mirror. It starts with you humbling yourself. It starts with you rejecting hypocrisy by concentrating on and correcting your blind spots before you try to confront anyone else about theirs. He's going, don't make excuses. Don't build your case. Don't justify yourself. Just admit it. Embrace humility. And you know what humility looks like? It looks like listening more and talking less. It looks like caring more about people than you do about being right. It, it looks like being honest about your own struggles. It looks like have mercy on me, God, on me, because I am a sinner. Most of the time we can't see our own blind spots and that's what makes them a blind spot, which is why we need each other. I wanna read you a couple, of verses, a couple of verses out of Galatians and then we're gonna pray. In Galatians chapter six, verses one and two, they won't be on the screen, I just want you to listen. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter to a church, to a group of people just like us who are trying to wrestle with and figure all this out. The Apostle Paul writes this in chapter six. He says, dear brothers and sisters, if another, there's a couple of parts that I want you to hear, if another believer, okay, if another believer, not somebody who's not a believer, not somebody that lives next door to you that you wanna meddle in their stuff, in their business, if another believer, somebody that is connected to you because of you're a part of the same family of faith, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful that you don't fall into the same temptation or the same sin or the same mess yourself. And then he adds this in verse two. He says, share each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill or obey the law of Christ. And what is the law of Christ? It's the one thing that Jesus gave. He said, go and love like I've loved you. That is the one and only law Jesus gave. Go love each other like I've loved you. So what if you and I found the courage to stop trying to dig the specks out of the people around you and just confront the inside of us? Stop trying to get all the outside looking good, confront the inside. What if you found the courage to ask somebody close to you like, hey, is there an area of my life where my words and my actions don't match. And then don't be defensive, just listen. Is there somebody that you've elevated yourself over? Is there a group of people that they think this way, they vote that way, they dress like this, that you go, I, at least I'm not like them. If you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. Finally, if you've been hurt by hypocrisy, I just want you to know how very much God loves you. And it leaves you in kind of a bit of a difficult spot because it's impossible to really be a genuine follower of Jesus and reject his family. And so you're kind of stuck in that hard spot because you got, you're, you're being drawn to follow a perfect savior and he's inviting you or asking you to be a part of a very imperfect community of people, maybe the same community of people that hurt you or betrayed you or elevated themselves above you. But here's what I want you to know. If you will step into relationship with Jesus, that God begins to break down all the false pretenses we have of ourselves. If you will let him, he will begin to heal your heart and you can actually find a place here and put down some roots and start to trust again. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love in our lives. 
God, we surrender to you, to the truth that we've heard today. May your Holy Spirit take it and drive it deep into the core of our souls so that as we wrestle with it, God, we would come to terms, we'd have to reckon with who we are and what it is that you wanna say to us. God, whatever else can be said about us as your followers, as this faith community, may it not be said that this is a place of hypocrisy. This is a place full of hypocrites. We all have things that we say where we do do things differently. But Lord, let this not be a place where we elevate ourselves above, above others. May it be a place, God, where we humble ourselves, where we listen more than we talk, where we say, have mercy on me, on me. God, I'm a sinner. For those that have been hurt in this area, God, that they were a part of a a church or a faith community, or they had people in their lives that represented you that were Christians and they were imperfect and they, in their own hypocrisy, elevated themselves and said and did things that were hurtful. I pray that in this moment that we would have the courage to be honest about that, to bring all of that to you, begin to let you heal us and work forgiveness into our hearts. And then for those, God, who have never stepped into relationship with you, may this be the moment that we say simply, I give you my life, Jesus. Have mercy on me, God. I'm a sinner. Thank you, Lord, for the truth that we've heard today. In your name we pray. Amen. And South amen. Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that He's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because the Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that He can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.